And we especially honor the ancestors of Greenwood, the Native Americans of this area and state, along with the spirit of harmony that connects us all in community. I would also like to give special thanks to our sponsors, and noting that a few sponsors are still in the process of submitting funds. So this is the current list that you can see um, on the website and also on the poster outside if it doesn't pop up on the screen. Um, and then now I'd like to turn uh, the podium over to Dr. Dwayne Dickens and Reuben Gant for a moment to remember a legend, Mr. Julius Pegues. So again, let me thank you for being here this evening and for every part of the symposium you have been working with us and, and, and contributing to. So we appreciate that. In this third of four tributes that we have for Mr. Pegues, we now focus on his lifelong work of preserving the history of people of color. Mr. Pegues, the past chair of the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation, is our legacy builder who we are recognizing and honoring today. His footprint touches all throughout this city, state, and the nation. Every time I hear of something that's going on, I just heard five minutes ago something else that he had done. There's one more thing that you just keep hearing that he has done over his lifetime. And so, Mr. Pegues believed in preserving the history and making sure that we knew this. And it fits in very nicely with John Hope Franklin's perspective that if you don't know someone else's history, you do not know your history. And so, Julius Pegues actually lived this life and lived that every day. And I remember one episode that I remember well is we had a large group that we were providing a tour from for, Green for Greenwood. And there was one statue, and if you've been to the park, there's a statue where there's a man holding a baby. And, and I had been on a tour, several tours with people, and I'd ask them the same question, who is this man? And they would just say, well, it's a, it's a white man holding a baby. I said, well, could you give me a little more detail? Well, I'm not sure, you may want to ask Julius or someone else. So it, there, this happened several times. So during this tour when I was with Julius, right before the people came, I said, Julius, who is this man? <laughs> and so he looked and he said, well, okay, it's, it's here. Let me, let me grab it out of my mind. So that, that just reminded me that he had so much history in his mind, but he was willing to share it. So he said, oh, yeah, I have his name, Maurice Willows from the American Red Cross. And from that point, I read a little bit more so that when I give tours, I make sure that I point out that this American Red Cross executive director was the grandson or grandfather of Bob Howard. If, you, if you're around Tulsa, you remember that Bob Howard was a news anchor. And he, this Maurice Willows, was the executive director who wrote this book that is the American Cross the documentation of what happened at what the Red Cross did for the Tulsa race massacre. And so the man standing there with the baby that was born during this race massacre is a message of hope. And so when I think of what Julius was providing is that through history, we can find hope. We can see how partnerships come together. We can see how reconciliation works. And so that is what when I think of Julius's part in this work, it definitely preserves that history. So that, that's the story that I have, and then Reuben is going to break it down in even more detail, and so I turn it over to Reuben. Good evening. I have once again the opportunity and the honor to share with you my experiences with Julius. Uh, 
I've known Julius for 58 years, uh, and I've worked with him closely for the last uh, 23 years. Uh, and in all that time, uh, I still learn uh, thing, new things about what uh, Julius has been involved with. But two or three of the most notable things are uh, Reconciliation Park. Uh, I, uh, I remember when we were appointed to a commission to build a memorial to the race massacre. And uh, Julius was appointed chair of this committee. And it turned out to be like a like two-year endeavor. And we finished our job, turned our work over to the state legislature, and uh, uh, Julius was talking to me about, well, what's going to happen next? Uh, so we can't let this die. And the legislature appropriated some monies for us to do this, but the funds dried up because of the state budget at the time. Uh, and so there were four individuals uh, that wouldn't let this project die, uh, led by Julius. And within about, I would say, a six-month period, uh, uh, we collectively raised the balance of the funds needed to finish the park, uh, which was about $1.3 million that Julius led the effort to raise, and we finished the park. Well, in doing that, the next thing was, what's going to happen next? Well, that's how the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation came to fruition. Uh, through the efforts of Julius, three other individuals, and then we eventually created a board of 23 persons that are contributing their efforts to this community. That's just one effort uh, by Julius. The other is you'll, when you go through the OSU campus, uh, you will see uh, the, uh, there is a monument it sits across the street from here. Uh, that's a monument to, uh, that depicts the original location of the Booker T. Washington High School here in the Greenwood District. Julius played an integral part in getting that done. Uh, if you go to the east a little bit to this building uh, next to us, uh, there is a plaza there called the E.W. Woods Memorial Plaza. And that is a memorial to the first principal of Booker T. Washington High School that served for 35 years. And on these pillars, these pillars are examples of the quality of students and the quality of education that was produced out of Booker T. Washington High School as a segregated school from uh, 1916 to 1950, and again, that was part of most of Julius's work. So Julius has spent his life uh, preserving the memories, the legacies, the accomplishments of African Americans in Tulsa. And for him and for this community, we gladly pay tribute to him for that. So thank you. And so now we have the next portion where we get to hear in song how Julius's tribute of life comes from Miss Olivia Davis. And so you will enjoy her rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. And just a note, she is a recent graduate from the University of Tulsa and don't want to diminish those and not say what it is. She is, I want to make sure I say this. She just finished her bachelor's degree in music with two minors in anthropology and African American studies and began her music education at the age of 10, studying piano and music theory. So Olivia, looking forward to hearing from you tonight. 
Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felled in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady our weary feet come to the place for which our Father sighed. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Thank you, Olivia, for that wonderful tribute um, to the past chair of the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation. <clears throat> I'm so glad that the message of the song points us to lifting every voice until even the heavens hear our unified advocacy toward reconciliation. Tonight, we hear from <clears throat> another voice from the chorus. Dr. Natalia Petrozella. Dr. Petrozella is a historian of contemporary American politics and culture. She's the author of Classroom Wars, Language, Sex, and the Making of Modern Political Culture, published by Oxford University Press, and the forthcoming Fit Nation, The Rise and Price of America's Exercise Obsession, which will be published by the University of Chicago Press. Natalia is a frequent media guest expert, public speaker, and contributor to international and domestic news outlets from the New York Times to the Washington Post to CNN and The Atlantic. She is associate professor of history at the New School, co-founded and directed the <clears throat> Wellness Education Program Health Class 2.0, and is a premier leader 
of the mind body practice inten <clears throat> intensati sorry <laughs> she holds a BA from Columbia and a master's and PhD from Stanford please join me in welcoming Dr. Petrozilla I've been told this mic is a little better for a longer talk, so you all can hear me okay, right? And then my slides should come up shortly. Um, thank you so much for such a kind introduction and what a tough act to follow, a beautiful song. So um, thank you, but also, no, <laughs> it was really beautiful. Um, and I feel just in the few hours that I've been here, I've heard so much about Mr. Pegues' legacy and his contribution. So I'm sorry I was not able to meet him in person, but I'm sorry for all of your loss. Um, all right, so let's get started. I'm setting my own timer to, to stay on track here. So, you know, when I was invited here tonight to talk about, um, you know, finding reconciliation, uh, it is a really tall order in today's time to think about how we might even come close to reconciliation in a moment that seems so riven politically, culturally, um, and otherwise. But I'm really heartened by this idea of using history to find hope and by the mission of the center here to do what we can to seek out and to dream of social harmony as something worth working for, because that's certainly something I do in my work. So the big question, can we move from classroom wars to reconciliation? And I use the term classroom wars to describe um, the kind of intense conflicts over what goes on in American schools. Um, can we get from that? And we're in a very tough moment in that regard to reconciliation. So first, who am I? You heard my bio, I'm a scholar, I was a classroom teacher, I'm an activist. But you know, I'm also a mom with school-aged children and a human being. And I have to say that one of the things that I've realized, or that I realized a few years ago in teaching about the history of education is that it was like my greatest accomplishment, I thought, to teach all of my students in many ways like the hard, true history that is that of our country and that of our educational history. I wanted them to understand structural inequality and institutional racism and misogyny and all of these things. And then when I got them to understand that, I felt like, well, now they know. I realized a few years into teaching, that's like maybe not even half the battle. That's the beginning of the battle because what I saw happening is that they would learn about all of this troubled history of our nation and a lot of them would feel sort of disempowered to be able to do anything about it, right? And so really I've devoted the last years of my career through this various activist programs and all through, through a kind of more engaged scholarship to trying to hit that sweet spot with my students but also in my work in the world of how do we reckon honestly and fully and with an unsparing kind of commitment to truth and to look at the ugliness of American history face on but to never lose sight of the fact that change actually is possible and that actually understanding that darkness is a crucial um, step to achieving something better. So to that end, you know, what I want to do tonight is kind of take a walk, not a boring one, I promise you, through some of the culture wars in our history that I think really illuminate our moment, but also, you know, how history that never provides perfect parallels um, but it does, I think, provide really useful precedents to understand the process of how we got here. And so I've picked six or seven culture wars, some of which you've heard of, some of which you haven't heard of, to kind of parse a little bit and help us understand where we are today and wh how we might move forward. Um, and uh, let's see. Yes. So I think the first thing that I want to say is that, you know, American public education as we know it, or not really as we know it, was founded in the 19th century. And it was founded on the loftiest of purpose. If you look at what's often considered the kind of foundational document of American public schools, it's a kind of charter written by this Massachusetts reformer, Horace Mann. And he talks about how the common school can be the great balance wheel of society. Public schools are going to be the institutions which get, allow American children to transcend their 
social station at birth to do something and to be something better and to kind of impart a common creed. So there's this really, really lofty, lofty notion on which common schools are born. Now very quickly, as you're gonna see, as soon as the United States endeavors or becomes a more diverse nation and endeavors to pull more and more people into those institutions and projects, it's going to be clear how exclusive that so-called universalism actually is and how impossible, I don't want to say impossible, but how much more work needs to be done to create any kind of common institution which will actually serve its increasingly diverse citizen citizenry well. Um, and so, you know, I think any historian often cautions what's very common in kind of popular recountings of history, cautions against so-called golden age thinking, right? Like, the old days were so great and now everything's gone into decline, or vice versa. The old days were so terrible and we've been on a straight progress narrative ever since. Neither of those is true. So I, was, I always like to have images for my slides and so I actually looked up ideal schoolhouse to find this picture up there, which you see. And it's funny, it's in some guy's uh, folder called like the good old days. Like remember when schools were like this? So if you look at that picture there, I hope that you can see it in this lighting. You know, sure, okay, the kids look clean and orderly, but look at how much even in the good old days was not that great. First of all, like there's this poor little boy in the back, the only one not with his hand up, right? You can imagine he doesn't feel so great in that situation. The kids are all sitting perfectly in rows, right? No, none of the group work and kind of collaborative learning that we think is so important today. And then, of course, there's the huge question of who's not in that room, right? Those are all a bunch of little white faces there together. This is in the 1950s, so it's already kind of exemplifying the problem of the so-called good old days. And good old days thinking is so, so preeminent, I think, in a lot of kind of contemporary commentary about what's wrong with education today. Okay, so onwards. Beginning in the 19th century, I think the first classroom war to think about is the classroom war that was um, waged really by Irish Catholic immigrants who came to this country right at the time that Horace Mann was talking about this great balanced wheel of society and immediately show up in public schools in northeastern cities primarily and they encounter at least two big problems. One, this so-called universal creed, the skill of learning to read that was supposed to be for all all American children, well, they're using the King James Bible, which is not a Bible that any of these, not a version of the Bible that Catholic parents wanted their children to use. So that was the first issue that kind of showed the limits of man's idea. But then the second problem is that the place was rife with kind of unapologetic anti-Irish race, well, really it was racism at the time, but anti-Irish sentiment. So parents would write, would write to teachers, and this exists in the, in the written record, you know, my child was told today that the cities of New York are turning into, the streets of New York are turning into the common sewers of Ireland. Like, we don't want our child hearing that at school. So you can see that early on, there was already this sense that this universal project of a common school, as the US was getting my, more diverse, was going to be um, really problematic to achieve. Now what's really interesting here, so this is a cartoon by Thomas Nast, a famous political cartoonist that came out in 1871 in Harper's A Political Magazine. And if you can see here, those are supposed to be Catholic bishops depicted as reptiles coming up on, on the shores of um, uh, on America. American shores. Then you have the school teacher who's kind of defending his children from this incursion. And then you have, um, it's hard to see over here, the American flag is upside down. There's a cross on the top of uh, Congress. And there's this idea that this is part of a kind of Catholic plot to invade and take over American schools and American culture, right? And what's really interesting is, so this came out in 1871. There'd been Irish immigration going on for a long time. And what this was actually resisting was not so much the presence of Irish children in schools, but it was the fact that when Irish parents were confronted with this kind of anti-Catholic sentiment, what a lot of them did was go and establish their own separate school system. So they were sending their children to Catholic schools, that's 
um, you know, an important step in the rise of Catholic schools in this country. And the risk here, the idea was, well, this is going to cause disunity. These kids are getting this Romish, that's what they called it, this Romish education, and they're not going to be able to be good Americans. This is causing cultural disunification. And of course, Irish Catholics were not happy about this either because they were paying a double tax, right? They were being taxed for public schools, their kids, they didn't want to send their kids to, and they were funding these schools on their own. So I think in this case, like, I don't need to spell out for you that some of these themes are so much with us today, right? But on the other hand, there is, I mean, I see people smiling because in some ideas, the idea that the big sort of like xenophobic push would be against Irish Catholics, we're not totally done with anti-Catholic sentiment in the US today, but it seems like something of long ago and far away in certain ways. Okay, so moving on, you know, and it, this is not an exhaustive uh, journey through the culture wars, but I picked some that I thought would be evocative to understand our moment. This is from a school in the city, I'm, I'm from New York City, um, on Mott Street, and these are Chinese American children who are going to a school that prided itself on its Americanization curriculum. So Americanization curricula at the turn of the 20th century were curricula that in a moment of intense immigration in the Northeast from Southern and Eastern Europe, but also there were a lot of um, Chinese American kids there, and in the West from Asia and also from uh, uh, Mexico, it was a moment when there was a kind of unapologetic commitment to making good Americans of children by stripping them of the backwards customs and ways of their immigrant parents. And it was unapologetic in a way that I think kind of shocks today. And so you saw, you know, this coincided with the rise uh, or the birth of progressive education and this notion that what schools should do is educate the whole child. And some of that was sort of really sounds kind of empowering and lovely, like they should work with their hands and they should play and we should have differentiated curricula that meet children where they are. But when it converged with these Americanization curricula, it often meant, oh, educating the whole child was, we're going to teach you what food you should eat because your mom doesn't know how to cook for you. We're going to teach you how to, um, you know, fold your clothes and how many times you should brush your teeth a day because I bet your parents didn't tell you that. And so there's this kind of flip side to that em empowering nature that comes through this Americanization project. Now, in terms of how this all gets worked out, I picked this picture because you know, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of parents who resisted this and children who resisted this. And often what ended up happening in this period, and one of the kind of intellectual contributions of this period, is that, is that there came to be a kind of appreciation of, the, of melting pot ideology, a kind of idea that, okay, maybe this hardcore Americanization is not the best thing for these kids. Actually, America's a melting pot, and it's beautiful that people from different cultures are coming together. But what is really important to note is that only certain sorts of so-called immigrant gifts were considered kind of beautiful and worth celebrating. So here you have, this was a celebration of American patriotism, but you see that these Chinese American kids, the little shaded through there, are wearing on top of their school uniforms, they were asked to wear kind of traditional Chinese dress when they came into school. And I was interviewing, very different context, a um, Puerto Rican activist um, from the 1950s, and I said, so do you feel that there's been progress, like in these years that you've worked, you know, you know, in, in, in trying to really create a more multicultural accepting environment. And she says, well, the kind of multiculturalism we have now is food, folk dancing, and fiesta. And she talked about the kind of limited nature of celebration of diversity, which sure is better than like hardcore Americanization, your parents are backwards and terrible and we need to teach you English and you should never look back. But it's a very limited kind of um, vision of what schooling in a diverse society might look like. Okay, um, so moving right along down to Tennessee, this is an image from the Scopes trial, which uh, that's probably one of the more famous ones that I picked today. So the Scopes trial is very famous because a high school teacher who is uh, uh, 24 years old was, Scopes, was uh, teaching evolution. And there was an anti-evolution statute in the state it was actually 
planned by people who wanted to bring people to Dayton, Tennessee to make a big show trial out of it. And so it was almost like a tourism recruiting tactic. Scopes actually said, I'm not really sure if I even taught evolution, but I know it's in this textbook that we use. So sure, I'll be your, um, I'll be your defendant. And so these two very high profile lawyers, Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, take up this cause of prosecuting this teacher for teaching evolution. It becomes a national event, it's in the press, people are watching. This is this guy T.T. Martin, who was an, eva an evangelist. He sees that there's a market opportunity here, so he shows up in Dayton and he's known for roaming the streets saying, there's a real battle going on. It's hell versus the high school out there. And he sells a book called Hell Versus the High School for anyone that's, listen that's listening. So this to me, I mean the fundamental, and by the way, so Scopes loses because he was teaching evolution, but it's seen as this really important moment in kind of, you know, legitimizing the teaching of evolution in schools, in, in, in kind of pushing back on this kind of fundamentalist idea that um, religion belongs in schools. And I think what's really important there is like bringing those issues to the fore, which continue to be really important and things I won't talk about today, prayer in school and otherwise. But also here is a case where the kids were kind of beside the point in this culture war. These were grown-ups fighting with each other. They actually bring children on the stand and they're like, did you learn evolution? And they're like, yes. And like, can you explain the theory? Uh, like they couldn't even really do it and no one really cared because the point in this fight was not about the curriculum. The point was about what kind of society are we building in schools and what kind of ideas should we be imparting to the next generation even if the next generation was not doing the reading, apparently. Um, okay, so moving on to the post-World War II period, this is lesser known, and I think one of my sort of favorite chapters, I think, in American history for understanding a lot of what is going on today, this period of life adjustment education. So if you consider that after World War II, you have this moment when a lot of men and some women had gone off to war. There's a real fear about the impact of disruptions in the American family on children. So you have real worries about juvenile delinquency. If you remember the movie Rebel Without a Cause, that's like a perfect crystallization of those fears. And a notion that society after two world wars, a depression is really in a mess. And that schools have a responsibility to deal with that. At the same time, you have the rise at this moment of a kind of greater acceptance of therapeutic interventions. So going to therapy, a kind of what uh, some scholars call um, really the rise of a therapeutic culture and the kind of psycholog psychologization of everyday life. So there emerges in this period this thing called life adjustment education. Now, some of life adjustment education had this kind of democratic, progressive impulse. The idea was we have more kids than ever in schools, and we not all of them are going to college or on the academic track. We, for too long, have focused on the gifted and the academic folks. We need to have uh, classes that allow them to just adjust to life. And so there were classes, this is like shop and woodworking, but also learning how to balance your checkbook, um, kind of applied almost like trade education in school. But that therapeutic piece, which I think is so interesting, meant that you also had all of this instruction, like these instructional films, this is from one called How to Control Your Emotions subtitle, snap out of it, right? And it goes into great detail about how to kind of be an emotionally well-balanced pers person. There are others, and these are like, long, like 15, 20 minute movies, how to be popular, when to go steady. And it's this kind of commitment to a form of education which is highly therapeutic, highly kind of psychological, 
and really not academic. So what ends up happening, and you can see here, this is a still from Control Your Emotions, and so they bring in this kind of white coat psychiatrist, and he tells the children very sternly, you're an adolescent, you may feel rage, fear, love, these are very strong feelings, they all comprise your personality, but it's up to you to kind of like calm down and take the middle road. It's a pretty conformist approach to, to being a full person. But what ends up happening, so this is the Cold War, is that there's a very strong pushback at it to this is not academic at all, right? And so what are we doing? This is the era of Sputnik, if you remember. Um, and not that anyone in this room would be old enough to remember, but if you remember from history class. Um, this is an era when there is a fear of you, the US of US kids not only being delinquents and kind of psychologically misguided, but also of falling behind, particularly in science and technology. And so there's this real pushback to this. This is not academic, and this is terrible for um, children. And then um, at the same time, this kind of creates, I think, a really important and damaging dual trope around teachers, which builds on older tropes as well, but is both that, well, teachers are wasting our kids' time and our tax dollars doing things that aren't academic. Why are they watching films about going steady and doing home ec and not learning math and Russia's going to the moon and what are we going to do? So this notion that teachers are wasting taxpayer dollars. But at the same time, this notion that teachers are in the business of sensitivity training and analyzing your children's feelings and telling them, like, what their values and their emotions should be, that evokes another stereotype, which is teachers are trying to brainwash kids. And a lot of that, those are not totally new stereotypes in this period, but this era kind of heightens those two tropes, which are very much with us today. So what ends up happening? Well, um, you know, the big education act that you hear about in the 1950s is the National Defense of Education Act in 1957, which funds science and technology. So these guys lose, <laughs> and you end up having much more of an investment in science and technology. But I would say that, you know, today we have all this talk about social emotional learning. Like, this is really when that kind of therapeutic psychological language in meaningful ways entered schools. Okay, I have this teacherly impulse to be like, are there any questions now? But we'll, we'll get that. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So this is a much, much more famous image, right? Of 1957, the desegregation of Little Rock, Arkansas, when the National Guard was called in by, um, by uh, uh, President Eisenhower to desegregate. And of course, I mean, this needs no explanation, I think, particularly at uh, a center like this. But you have desegregation. This is, of course, three years after Brown v. Board, which feels like a long time. Like, why was it taking three years? But of course, in my own home city of Boston, in the 1970s, you have white massive resistance and Irish Catholics, by the way, the same folks who were having some trouble back in the 19th century, throwing rocks at buses that were bringing black children to previously all white schools. So um, I don't want to rehash the story of desegregation here, but I think one of the things that's really interesting in thinking about culture wars and this particular one, probably the most intense conflict over education in any of our, in our recent history or ever in the history of education in the United States, is thinking about the way that this is, one, not resolved. We still have a largely segregated school system in the United States, if not through legal measures, but the way that um, uh, the way that the, what moved the needle in many ways on Brown v. Board of Education uh, on uh, on implementing of desegregation was not so much a kind of moral concern of the powers that be of Eisenhower and his associates, but and I draw on the wonderful work of Mary Dudziak here, a legal historian. The U.S. was really concerned that the rest of the world in the Cold War was looking at the United States and eating up uh, Soviet propaganda that was correctly saying, look at how black people live in America. Look at how they treat poor people. Look at the racial segregation that exists there. Is that what you want? Now, that kind of propaganda was circulated in what was then called the Third World. And as the US and the Soviet Union were competing for the sympathies during the Cold War of 
Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera, that was really compelling. So I draw on her excellent work there to argue that that's a really important part of the story to realize that in, in, in that book and other scholars have said the National Guard probably wouldn't have gone in if there hadn't been that kind of Cold War impulse. So I think that's, to me, like teaching this to my students is so interesting because they're either like totally bought into this rosy progress view of then everybody woke up and realized like racism was terrible and like yay and it took a long time but the you know the road to justice is long and that's not not true that there have always been those kind of moral leaders in that presence but I think it's really important when we think about enacting change what are those pragmatic concerns what are those um, if not quite lessons from history historical examples that help us understand what has moved the needle there and of course, you see on the communist tip here that you see that here, the people holding signs are saying not that race separation is communist, is, is communist, but race mixing is. So that's a story for another lecture, but the fluidity of how slurs about communism can be used is really quite something during, the, during these years. Um, okay, so this is... Uh, Sadly, when I started writing this, researching this dissertation, people were like, this is so random. Fights over sex education and these right-wingers who call sex educators like groomers and pedophiles, like that's so niche. And now it's kind of everywhere, much to my chagrin, although I'm glad I have this historical context. So something that happens during the 1960s and early 70s as the sexual revolution is heating up and the Supreme Court narrows the definition of obscenity such that you know what used to be considered pornographic might now be the cover of a bodice ripper novel that you would see at the supermarket and uh, billboards can be much more explicit. So all of that is happening and a whole bunch of pretty honestly middle of the road teachers and nurses and public health folks say excuse me schools have got to have a role in dealing with this like it is up to us to equip children with skills to understand what's going on around them what's really interesting is Although they were criticized as like perverts and groomers was in the language of the time, but sort of like, you know, real radicals, you read these curricula as I have read tens and probably even hundreds of them, it's very moderate what they promoted. First, they were all called like family life education or family life and sex education rather than sex ed in order to sort of like diminish the sex part of it. And usually they culminated in um, marriage, heterosexual marriage, like it was all like by the time you get to 12th grade, it's like, and soon you'll be ready to start a home with your husband or your wife. They were, they spoke about sexuality and kind of what, the, you know, petting and necking, but they tended to say you cannot let things go too far, never mention sort of female pleasure. I mean, it's a pretty moderate um, approach that these, that these curricula had but they get seized upon by opponents as examples not of folks trying to sort of manage this more eroticized landscape, but of hippie teachers who are part of the problem. Now the perverts are in your classroom too. And this is the language. So this book over here, The Child Seducers by John Steinbacher, gets circulated, it's like really thick. It's actually voiced on an album, like a record, by Michael Caine, the author. You can listen to it on YouTube if you'd like. So it's in this really foreboding British voice. And he says that sex education is part of a nefarious, globalist, communist plot to turn your children into sex slaves. And he said, and if you manage to get sex education out of your school, be careful. Oh, I'm sorry, they call it sex instruction because they want to focus on the fact that it's teaching your kids to have sex. Be careful. Social studies is going to have it for, in, for your kids too and also sensitivity training. And the basic idea was that this sort of education was brainwashing children to abandon the morality of their parents and of their uh, religious uh, institutions and to basically be totally beholden to their own desires. And what's really interesting too is that this communist theme weaves through here. The very first seminar paper I ever wrote and, and published was about a sex education curriculum which was tarred as communist and as wacky as that might sound the superintendent got thrown out of the 
district because it actually worked. And the idea was this is a globalist plan and you see some of the parent newsletters and it says, do you want your state to turn into Sweden? Um, and which the idea is, you know, more like family leave, gender, more gender parity in terms of family roles. But what I want to point out here too, lest you think that these um, instances I'm choosing are too disconnected, you know, one of the depravity narratives, to use the words of a sociologist, Janice Irvine, one of the depravity narratives that circulates about what happens in sex education class is precisely about the fear of race mixing. And so there was this one story that circulated quite often in this town I looked at, Anaheim in Southern California, which is, well, I heard in sex education class, they turn off the lights and they play wild African music and let the children dance together. First of all, at the time, Anaheim was basically an entirely white community, now it's largely Latino, but you can see this kind of fear of what happens if the kind of moral infrastructure that certain parents think is what schools should impart starts to fall away. And all of these fights are much more intense in moments of great social change. And of course, the 60s and 70s are not just the sexual revolution, but the continued civil rights, um, freedom struggle, gay liberation, um, et cetera. This I put up here, so this was a pamphlet by a pastor, Gordon V. Drake, pretty straightforward. Is the schoolhouse a pro the proper place to teach raw sex? This was um, sold like a million copies. Granted by his count, I haven't been able to verify that, but I think when we think about the role of media in circulating these stories throughout the country, that is really salient to understand today. One of the things that happened in, in this era, which was fascinating, is that a lot of parents actually were sort of okay with what was going on in their own community, but they kept hearing about what's happening in California, what's happening in this district in Massachusetts. They're coming for you next. And so there was this sense of this like impending or kind of imminent curricular apocalypse, which was going to end morality and sort of tradition and all that the, some parents considered good. Um, and the last thing I want to say on here is like it seems over the top and sort of just like especially when you think of how little curricular time sex ed actually took up in those days and takes up today. It seems really sort of over the top and it was but it could materialize in real violence. In 1974 in Kanawha County in West Virginia there was a, an activist named Alice Moore who started a kind of um, protest of textbooks that she said were had a kind of you know like literacy um like storylines that uh, that were aggressive to ideas of kind of normative heterosexual families she they she didn't like the sex ed curriculum she didn't like that social studies was what she called anti-american and it ended up with death threats and harassment of one superintendent it ended up with an, a firebomb attack on one elementary school so this stuff really really materialized and i think what's really important to think of as the legacy for this period is that wildly enough actually i would say that the progressives kind of won because the line of conservatives in this period was stop talking about sex with kids. You have to be silent on this matter. This is totally inappropriate to come up at school. Ironically, by making such a big deal, and this was all over the press, they end up amplifying the volume of these conversations and you kind of can't put that cat back in, back, in the ba back in the bag. And so after this period, you have conservatives no longer saying we can't talk about this at all at school, but offering alternative curricula. Not that I think that is so great, because that basically materializes an abstinence-only curricula, but the idea that no sex ed will happen in school is effectively off the table. Um, there's some really incredible footage that, that, that I included when I first did this research where, like, kids, the idea was like protecting innocent children, but the children would show up at the school board meetings and like want to contribute and the parents would be like, you shut up, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it was always interesting when the kids get involved. So the last one that I want to focus on before we turn to kind of our current day is um, perhaps familiar to you. I'd say this is like has medium recognizability, but the fights for bilingual bicultural education and the way that 
as in this picture from Los Angeles, East Los Angeles in 1969, the way that students were largely mobilized to walk out and to make claims for their own kind of curricular agenda. So here, you had a bunch of students and kind of faculty allies, and those are high school students, but some college students who joined up with them who are kind of like buoyed by some policy wins where you had in 1968 the Bilingual Education Act, which is the first federal act that recognizes linguistic minorities as kind of you know, deserving of extra help. They're kind of buoyed by that, but also feel that's not doing enough. We're walking out. We're taking it to the streets. And I think one of the things that's really important here is that bilingual, the Bilingual Education Act is really about language. But they're saying, this is not just about language. This is about culture. And they're making a claim for Chicano studies classes, um, for different curricula, but also for much broader demands, like hiring minority Im um, administrators, integration of schools. And what ends up happening is that a lot of this brown power movement ends up allying with other progressive causes of the day around opposition to the Vietnam War, around um, the black freedom struggle as well. And the legacy here, I think, is really kind of complicated to think about because what ends up happening is that after that, this activism takes on a much more kind of like strident, like robust voice and kids are involved and it's really um, Chicano people leading their own struggle. And if you're asking me if that's good or bad, I think that's good in a lot of, in most ways. But what happens, what I didn't even know had existed, but what happens is that up until 1968, when these walkouts happened and when that act was passed, in California, like one of the biggest states to be dealing with this, Mexican American educational attainment was like a very bipartisan issue. One of the biggest kind of proponents of it was this guy, Max Rafferty, who was the superintendent of public instruction. And he was like the voice who said, he called it the Mexican American problem, which is some real questionable framing. But he was like the first one to say, we need resources. Like these kids are dropping out of school at 50% by eighth grade. And what is fascinating is once this movement radicalizes, they lose that moderate support. Arguably, they gained much more in other ways. But again, interest in, in, in thinking about the pragmatics of how to get things done, it's interesting to see what the costs of each of these things are, um, the costs and benefits. One of the other things I think is really, really important in thinking about these sorts of struggles and their framing is that not just these kids, but a lot of their allies, including the, um, the advocates and legislators who pushed for the Federal Bilingual Education Act, one of their big pushes was saying, we need to be sure that this is not framed as compensatory education. We do not want the fact that our kids are native Spanish speakers to be seen as a disability or a deficiency that needs to be fixed. And I think that that's really, really important. And that's something that some legislators like would not budge on. They could have gotten money under Title I. Like, oh, don't you want this? This is like a disability. They said, no. The minute that we categorize being a Spanish speaker as having a disability rather than making a vital contribution to like what this country is supposed to be about, then we've lost something that you can't really easily win back. And so I think, you know, what I hope I'm, I'm pushing us all to do here, because I'm doing it every day, is to kind of like think about the push and pull between these like philosophical dimensions of these fights and also the more pragmatic ones of how things get done on the ground. Okay, so we could go long on beyond here in terms of classroom wars, but I will say that one of the reasons that I kind of stopped in the late 70s, and this is, periodization is always a choice, it may or may not have been the best choice, is that you do start to have in the 1980s this real rise of a kind of just unapologetic push to basically defund public schools, right? That in the period that I'm talking about, like you always have some private schools and parochial schools and some homeschooling, but in the 1980s, there becomes to be a much kind of stronger voice, mostly on the right of like, forget it. Homeschooling grows in great numbers. There are a whole bunch of uh, tax, uh, there's a bunch of tax legislation in different states that makes it more favorable to send your kids to a religious school. And so 
Contestation over public education is certainly not over, but I do kind of pick um, examples in that historical period because I think it, these are moments, or a long moment, a long, a long time, when the contestation over public education involves um, a kind of very wide range of the political spectrum. So moving forward to the latter part of our talk, I hope I can, I've pulled out some of these themes that I think are still with us today, but that permeate all of those. One, anxiety about outsiders, right? That these culture wars, in cl these classroom wars tend to flare when there's fear about change and some sort of outsider coming in, whether that's a hippie teacher, a new immigrant, antipathy to teachers. We have a weird thing in our culture, and I say this as a former classroom teacher, of both holding teachers up at, as heroes and as villains, right? And so in almost all of these cases, teachers tend to be positioned, as I mentioned, often in contradictory ways. They're both useless and overpaid and union hacks who aren't doing anything, and they get the summers off, and also, evil masterminds who are brainwashing your children and must be stopped. And that is a contradiction still with us and that we should, I think, be pushing back on. Um, there is a deference in some of these cases to parental authority, very narrowly defined. Some parents make claims on the classroom and what should happen, they are listened to. Sex ed was pulled from a lot of classrooms because a lot of white parents were up in arms about it and said, we don't want it. Some of those Chicano parents who showed up at school and were like, but wait a minute, like I want my kid to learn Spanish or you're not giving him the services that he needs. Or in one case, they actually decided to give the Spanish speaking kids placement exams in Spanish, but then they were all translated into Castilian Spanish from Spain. And these are Mexican kids. It's like if you asked a fourth grader to do British English for their placement, like, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. When parents showed up to complain about that, they're told, oh, I'm sorry, this is a neutral space. You, as, like, your child is an independent being here, and we have American values here. So parental authority, narrowly defined, I think this is so salient as parental rights becomes a big issue again today in politics. Concern that children are being victimized by often their teachers or educational bureaucrats, but also concern that they're becoming too powerful. Kids are developing their own sensibilities, their own value system, their own ideas distinct from their parents, and that's a problem. Um, clash over morals. Should schools be in the business of teaching what is right or wrong? You see that in the Scopes trial, but also in all of these more moral questions that come up later on. Skepticism overall of public institutions. I mean, I think that this is really, I mean, it's very much with us today, but in this latter period, particularly in the 70s, that's rising. If you notice that the sign that one of those uh, brown power activists was holding said, we want school, not prison. I mean, usually we talk about the right wanting to defund public institutions, and that's true. But there's a powerful strand of the left in this period too, and I think still today, that sees institution, a lot of institutions, particularly schools, as kind of like, if not fundamentally corrupt, sort of so damaged that hard to, like, but perhaps beyond repair. Um, and a sense, I think, of a lot of these folks of social decline. And so why do classroom wars become so intense when there is a sense of social decline? Well, you might not be able to stop the inexorable so tides of the world around you, but you sure can get mad about that social studies textbook, right? There's a school board meeting you can get to tonight where you can hear your voice heard. And I'm actually not even criticizing that impulse as someone who's gotten bent out of shape about plenty of things in my kid's school. But I think that when we like, seek to understand, sex ed was a few hours a year communist plot to brainwash your children? Like, what are you talking about? But I think the tangibility of school uh, issues and also the fact that it's your kid there kind of ratchets up the intensity of these fights. Um, so let's see, I, I'm told I have to click nine times to advance. Here we are. Okay, so today, so what do we do with this? Just in these last few minutes and then I'll open it up for questions. I'm so excited to hear from all of you. You know, as historians, we think a lot about periodization. What are kind of the appropriate places to stop and start an era?
It's a little early to tell, but I would imagine that March 2020 is going to be a really meaningful point to think about a new era in education and in the kind of classroom wars. I mean, what we could make a list of them. There are t definitely new ones, remote learning, masks, all kinds of COVID restrictions. I mean, those are kind of feel like totally new things. But in many ways, some of the same old issues have reared their heads in the last two years, right? Um, you know, uh, concerns about learning, uh, uh, concerns about learning loss, lack of academic, um, lack of academic progress, um, the kind of unequal way that those things have been felt in the wake, particularly of George Floyd's murder, um, concerns over whether critical race theory is really being taught in schools or not, but a kind of concern about putting CRT as a label aside about kind of perhaps excessive focus on race in classrooms. Um, a lot of these are kind of old issues in new packaging in certain ways. But I do think it, there is this kind of important break and new chapter that began um, in this period. And I would say, you know, the, the fights over education have become, have been especially bitter in the last couple of years and fast and furious. And I would say, you know, I would attribute that to one, people being on their screens. And so in terms of curricular issues, for a long time, a lot of parents were watching what was going on over their kid's shoulder in schools and either mad that not too much was going on or mad that too much was going on or mad that their kid isn't in school. I mean, there's a lot to kind of be angry about. But then I read a really interesting article recently um, by a, a principal, I believe, and she said that complaints from parents, which are usually a few in a semester or something were like through the roof this year. And she attributes this to the fact, not that things are going so awry, although there real, are real issues with return to school and mental health, but she says, because we have been so apart as people, and she talked about in her school community, kids were back in school, but parents weren't allowed in the building, they weren't having like the normal school concerts and potlucks and all of those things, that that lack of like togetherness and interaction meant that there'd been a kind of dissolution of good faith in people's connections with one another. So I don't know, that's her analysis of this. We all probably, we're all figuring that there's no data yet, people, on like what this era actually means. But these are sort of all things to think about as we, um, as we go forward. OK, so a path to reconciliation. Definitely can solve this in one slide, right? Um, well, good. That is a joke, but um, one of the things that I really put my like thinking cap on and thinking about like, well, what is a way to do this work I think is so important of using history to, in, to inspire some hope here. What are the issues in this particularly polarized moment where we might actually be able to come together? And I got a little help from Twitter on this, but I, I, these, I think, I think these, these are really solid ideas. Sorry? Uh, Someone said something. There was like a feedback in the mic. Okay, one, academic fundamentals. I think that most people would agree that children should learn children should learn to read and children should learn basic academic skills which will serve them well regardless of people's politics and that the last couple of years have really set us back um, in, in that and particularly kids most in need of, of that support. Um, mental health. It's interesting, you saw like the real pushback to any sort of therapeutic approaches that usually came from the right. Fascinatingly, in the last couple of years, sincerely or not, it's often been conservatives who have been saying, mental health is a crisis, right? Kids being out of school and being home is, is really not, if, if not causing these mental health problems, making them worse. That seems to be maybe somewhere we can find some common ground. Physical education, I mean, um, this is something particularly in the last couple of years, I think most people agree that they're at, with the uh, abridgment of a lot of sports programs and the closure in some cities of public parks and recreation facilities and the kind of screeniness of our life, that that is something that a lot of kids could benefit from. I've long been an advocate of physical education as central to a full curriculum. Civics instruction. This used to be a kind of conservative talking point, like we should just learn how government works and instead we have all these like wild like social studies curricula about faraway places. 
come on, like whatever your politics are, given the assault on voting rights in this country and, um, and uh, the, I mean, January 6th, again, is its own lecture, uh, kind of, you know, basic civics instruction seems to me something that we should be able to get behind. Screen time, this is something which enrages people on the right and the left for different reasons, but there should be able to be some common ground there. Um, and then this is a really hard one, but I think that we have got to find a way to uh, respect the expertise of educators again, right? And or if it ever really existed, but I think it's at a low point right now, to respect educators as having something um, inimitable to offer children and something that needs to be valued and compensated and celebrated. Um, respect for the authority of parents too though. I've seen too many kind of partisan fights break down to a like parents versus teachers. You parents, shut up. You don't know what your kids need. You teachers, stop trying to brainwash my children. Guess what? Everybody should have a voice in this and it is crucial that we work together in that. And from every school community I've actually worked in, not like people yelling at each other on social media, Everybody actually believes this is important, that teachers and parents should be sort of co-invested in the well-being of their kids. And then, of course, respect for the independence of young people. That's something that's been a little bit scrambled in the last few years, as a lot of the normal experiences of being independent, being out in the world, have um, not been um, have not been available to a lot of young people. And also, I think that a lot of these fights over curricula, much like back in the days of the Scopes trial, often kids are almost the second thought here, right? It t sometimes they can devolve into really fights among adults, and that is a loss for everybody, and I think we should really keep our, um, ooh, keep our eyes on the prize of, uh, you know, the advancement and the, and the, yeah, the advancement of young people, if not in the way that Horace Mann imagined in his very incomplete vision as a goal that should motivate all of us as we think about education going forward. So, thank you. Sorry I went over a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Dr. Petrozella. Um, we have time for some, a few questions. <laughs> Sorry, sure. we, I no, didn't do that okay. earlier. No problem. Um, I have a couple from the online viewership, but let's give the audience an opportunity to ask questions first. And actually, while, maybe while I'm traveling, let's, if you could just address one from online. Sure, and are you um, calling on people or am I? I'll let yeah, you. I'll, um, you. You go ahead and call, but okay. I want to ask one question really quickly because sure. I think it's relevant to this theme that I saw you really illuminate for us, which is, is the ways in which we can use history to find hope because sometimes history is very depressing. Yeah. But I think if we look at the past classroom wars, and the victories uh, yeah. in the midst of those tense moments, we can, we can be inspired. Um, so one viewer wants to know, what suggestions do you have for students, mostly high school, but maybe middle school as well, uh, to advocate for equity in their learning during these polarized times? Like, so how can peers, how can students actually advocate for themselves? Yeah, no, it's such a great question. Um, well, I think first, this is not the answer the student wants, but I would love to know, I would love to encourage the student who I wish was here tonight to think about what equity means to them because it's a word that gets tossed around so much right now. Like what's the equity you're looking for at what cost and what are the issues worth fighting for? And I think getting really, and I say that because equity is a, phenomenal goal and it's one that I'm glad is in the in the discourse right now but equity in wanting sort of like equal outcomes has real costs right in New York City where I am right now where equity is I think like most places a big conversation we're talking about um, getting rid of like the exams to for selective high schools right that seems like an equitable thing because th there are a lot of really terrible reasons those exams and that selectivity exist, but there are a lot of people who feel like, well, that's now, equity is gonna mean the same mediocre experience for everyone and that's not a good, good solution either. So my first su suggestion would be think about what equity means and where is it the right thing to fight for. Um, and th then I would say, 
you know, like some of the old-fashioned tactics are great. Getting out and marching. We're seeing that in my kids' school. They were in the streets today, marching after the tragedy in Texas. I think doing that, motivating your um, fellow students to kind of re-engage, it sounds so basic, but given, I don't know where, where the student was in school, but two years of video off Zoom is not really like a recipe for like being fired up about political action. So I think reconnecting with your friends, what issues mean a lot to you? What do you want to go out to a market? about? What should we start a petition about? What are we going to go to D.C. about? I think that kind of like reigniting the fire is really important. So I'm glad to hear the fire beginning to be reignited. Do you want to, you can call. You're the moderator. Go call yeah. the people. <laughs> Sorry, if that's okay. Thank you very much. This Thank is wonderful. You. Would you though agree that I think, I'm a, I'm a music teacher, that the music and the arts, drama, theater, are so hugely important to the success of any kind of reconciliation. Yes, and it is, I'm glad that you said that because so I sent in these slides on Monday. Yesterday I had lunch with a colleague who's a professor at Teachers College and I said, can you help me think of some other like things that people can come together on. And she texts me later, the arts, the arts, you gotta put in the arts. So I think that that is absolutely right. And I think the arts, if we're thinking in like, one, just really valuable skills and sensibilities, like it has this sort of also like broad political appeal in many ways too. Like the arts are about creativity and self-expression and meeting kids in ways that aren't like just book learning, which is a sort of a long-standing progressive approach. But there's also something about cultural formation and refinement and exposure to sort of like, um, you know, bettering yourself in that way that I think is so important. Thank you for reminding me of that. If I had had a day more, I, it would be on there too, but that's great. And thank you for the work that you're doing in schools. I want to know in particular, what is your kind of position on theories in the classroom in terms of like teachers in 21st century America and how important is understanding different theories and how did you go about your research in terms of balancing all of the different theories? I know we have some people that we may lean towards, some people may say Dewey, Progressivism, Jean Piaget or Bonhoeffer, you know, we have all these different theories that we are passionate about and we say, ooh, I think that should be taught in the classroom, but how did you kind of remove yourself from that and kind of to present more of a, uh, an accurate thesis um, you're in your research and what is your role in that in terms of how should educators you know be um, versed in all of these theories and how can that help shape instruction and making a classrooms more equitable more um, sustainable for the next generation of learners? That's such a great question so I have to and, and, and kindly phrased as well I have to say that you know I didn't really come to reading educational theory until I found myself as the chair of an education studies program and I had to teach intro to ed theory. So my background in a history department was not really one that was ground, like I didn't do, I never took an intro to ed theory class, I took a history of education class. So I read on my own, I'd read Dewey and Piaget and the folks that you're talking about, but it wasn't like that was my primary intellectual framework for either going into my scholarship or into the classroom. Having to learn it all later, I would say that when I actually sat down with the primary text, as you're discussing, I realized, like, as I think most people do, there's no one person who has it all figured out. And I would say, like, the methods I use in the classroom, and I'm always trying to get better and I don't have it all figured out, are a real Con, a real combination of like some truly old school Dewey stuff, but also, you know, some um, like much, like some of the real radical constructivist stuff or with like unessays and ungrading and, um, and also honestly some back to basics like conservative stuff of guys, I'm gonna mark up your paper and you've gotta, you can resist the dominant structures of grammar or of historiography, but you gotta understand before you resist, right? And so that might sound a little scattered, but I actually think like, I don't know what stage you're at in, in your career, but as you're working with students as a practitioner, I wouldn't say you want to you figure out what works because every kid is different and every class is different, but I tend to sort of try and braid together 
the different things that I'm learning from lots of these thinkers. And I think anyone who's, we all have the people who shape us, right? Like I would probably do anything my advisor, PhD advisor taught me to do, like I would sign on to anything she says. But I think if you're too sort of ideological to like one person, like there are gonna be holes in that, right? And I think you should like, the beauty of theory and any body of scholarship is it evolves, right? So yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Maybe. You list mental health as yes. one of the uh, um, planks in your path to reconciliation. And what we hear today is mental health is used as a total explanation for any antisocial behavior. And mental health in the way it is actually practiced means prescribing uh, psychotropic meds that have the known effects of homicidal and suicidal ideation. And I was at one time a child therapist and worked with kids individually, sometimes for years. That doesn't happen anymore, as far as I know. <laughs> now it's give a kid a pill. Did you say give a kid a pill? Is it a lot Yes, thing? give a kid a pill and control their behavior, dull them. There are so many things that are happening today that I, it seems to me, of course the children are going to hate school. You know, I'm glad yeah. someone with your background raises this issue because there are lots of disingenuous ways that mental health is used as a kind of catch-all or a slur. Oh, that person's just disturbed or as a way to discount all sorts of other things going on. And then, of course, there's the actual practice of what mental health looks like, which should encompass a lot of theories and a lot of approaches, but absolutely can just be the quick chemical fix. I hesitate to tell a personal anecdote, but I remember I took my, like, at the time, four-year-old to see a therapist because he couldn't sleep through the night. And the first thing that this guy said is, okay, sh I'm going to write you a prescription for sleeping pills. I'm like, do you want to meet my four-year-old first? And no sh shade to anybody who, who you know, this, I'm not an anti-chemical intervention person, but I think there's definitely something to what you're saying. But what I mean here, perhaps I should have been more precise, is not medicalizing every problem that we see, but rather investing in the full thriving of children with the range of resources that different kids need. And I think just to really highlight the importance of your point, one of the things I've been so frustrated about as a faculty member is that like mental health, wellness, blah, blah, blah. Oh, my students tell me it takes two months to get an appointment with the therapist, and they'll only meet in, uh, remotely. And that's just not the kind of intervention that somebody in crisis needs. And as you mentioned, we have more and more kids in crisis. So I'm not a clinician, so I'm not in a position to make specific recommendations, but I think you bring up really important limitations on a recommendation like that if it remains at the level of platitudes. But if it's a good faith commitment, hopefully it's something that we can get a more collective investment in because I think that is one of these across the aisle issues I would hope I am still sanguine enough to believe there are good faith people of very different beliefs who could get on board with that well thank you again let's give another round of applause to Dr. thank Petra you so Zeller. much thank you and thank you yes for your good questions Please remember, um, the QR code should pop up here in a second. Please remember to uh, evaluate the session, give us your feedback so we can keep improving and bringing you uh, the most riveting, entertaining, and thought-provoking speakers we can. Um, and thank you again for being here tonight. Uh, we also thank again our sponsors and for their support to the symposium. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. for a public deliberation regarding advocacy, education, and reconciliation by our Tulsa Debate Club youth team. You don't want to miss this. Please be here at 9.30 so you can hear the most important public debate from our youth. Um, so be safe, and I'll see you in the morning. Thank you.